Saigon, 1975. The North Vietnamese, after decades of aggression, achieve their goal and seize the southern capital. Panicked South Vietnamese who had fought with the U.S. discard their uniforms and abandon their weapons. But the staunchest U.S. ally during the war did neither. For them, the war is not over. They take their families and what few possessions they have and flee to the jungle to continue their fight against the North Vietnamese. It would be 17 years after the war ended before these fighters and their families were discovered deep in the Cambodian jungle. This group had been so forgotten, puzzled United Nations personnel quizzed them as to their identity. They were the full row army Montagnards, who had fought and died alongside U.S. Army Green Beret. This is their story. The Central Highlands of Vietnam home to a non-Vietnamese indigenous group of people became strategic ground for all the combatants during the Vietnam War. Both the CIA and the U.S. Army Special Forces, the Green Beret, deployed to the Highlands in the early war years to recruit these indigenous peoples, which they called Montagnards. This video explores the Montagnard fight for survival and how encroaching Vietnamese, anthropologists, Christian missionaries, and a devastating war was thrust upon them. Montagnards, Missionaries, and the Green Beret. When the French came to Vietnam in the mid-19th century, they were intent on establishing a missionary refuge beyond the steep coastal range past the reach or concern of lowland Viet Mandarins who periodically mounted violent persecutions of the foreign missionaries and their mostly peasant converts. Few persons but the occasional trader ever ventured into what the lowland Viet considered the remote and rugged mountains inhabited by wild animals, bad spirits, and fierce people they called moi, a term translated in French and English accounts as savage. The French missionaries in the 1840s were the first Westerners to find this collection of hill tribes, which they labeled Montagnards, meaning mountain people. Prior to the French colonization of the highlands in the 19th century, there had been no social structures among the highland peoples above the village level, and none of the dozens or more of the languages spoke among the highlands people had a word that designated highland people Montagnards as a single collectivity. The French hoped that the Highlands would provide a remote hideaway where Christianity could survive in Indochina if it were wiped out on the coast, where French colonial interests were still only being established. They began classifying the people they encountered into various tribes such as the Jarai, Sedang, Koho, Banar, Rade, and others. These groups had come to central Vietnam long before the Vietnamese. The politically divided Lowland Viet had been gradually extending their civilization south along the coast from Hanoi since achieving political independence from the Chinese in the 9th century. The Vietnamese dismembered and destroyed the Champa Empire and the Khmer Krom in the course of Nam Tien, what they called their southward march, which took the overpopulated land-hungry Vietnamese from their Red River Delta heartland to the mouth of the Mekong. But until 1900, the Catholic missionaries in Kontum were the only stable foreign presence in the highlands. They acted as the French administrators of this region and aided several French military explorations by providing ethnographic and geographic information 
interpreters, and guides. In 1911, a team of three CMA workers entered Indochina to establish the first evangelical church. This church was formed in 1927 and by 1940 was comprised of 100 self-supporting churches. They and other North American Protestant missionaries moved into the Central Highlands by the 1930s. The CMA is well known here in Thailand among older Christians. The organization was quite active in China, but in 1949, when the communists took over, the CMA missionaries fled through Laos and into Thailand, where they set up their missionary work. The missionaries encouraged the Highland people to assert their rights in the face of ill treatment by the lowland Viet. During the Vietnam War, Christian groups funneled vast amounts of development and emergency aid into the highlands as part of the broader American diplomatic, humanitarian, and military effort to win the hearts and minds of these tribes. Americans Gordon and Laura Smith came to the highlands in 1934 and in 1949 opened a leprosarium near the French-Vietnamese trading town of Bon Matut. Listen to Gordon in a CMA clip telling part of the story. While we were working here in Cambodia in 1929, we found ourselves on the border of this vast tribal empire. These many scores of primitive tribes had never had one ray of gospel light. They had never heard the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, the Redeemer of all mankind. God opened the door for us in 1934 to follow a trail 200 miles into the heart of this southern tribal area and we settled in a little strategic town called Ban Mitua. By 1962, there were nine missionaries working there, including a missionary doctor, 24 national co-workers, and nearly 1,500 patients. In 1968, communist forces invaded their Ban Matut leprosy center, killing five CMA workers and a volunteer layman. Beginning in 1961, U.S. Army Special Forces, Green Beret, came surreptitiously into the highlands under a CIA program designed to mobilize Highlanders to resist communist advances. The program provided funds for building schools, medical dispensaries, and wells. American volunteers from the International Voluntary Services supplemented Special Forces teams in developing agricultural or educational projects. Villages of the highlands are inhabited by many races, each with a tradition and a way of life distinctly its own. Known to the outside world by the French term Montanards, or mountain people, they are known to themselves by such tribal names as Rade and Mong, are vastly different from the light-skinned lowlanders whom the world knows as Vietnamese, believed to be the original inhabitants of the region before the arrival of the Vietnamese more than 2,000 years ago, most of the Montanards continue to live a Stone Age existence in the midst of the 20th century. Confined for centuries to the isolated areas of the plateaus, the Montanards have little contact with the city dwellers of the lowlands, take little interest in the complexities of modern life. For most of them, Vietnamese is a foreign language. For such people, words like communism and democracy have little meaning, cannot without great difficulty even be translated into their own dialects. Here in the mountains, both Saigon and the communist capital of Hanoi seem equally remote and unimportant. Through these mountain villages, for more than a decade, have passed increasing numbers of communist guerrillas, befriending the villagers, rewarding those who cooperate, terrorizing those who resist. The guerrillas have converted much of the highlands into a secure staging area for their assaults on the roads and population centers of the lowlands below. One Green Beret gift was Western medicine. When treatment proved successful, Americans offered to establish a permanent medical dispensary in villages and train the Montagnards to diagnose and treat common ailments. But in order to get the dispensary, villagers would have to agree to build defenses to keep the communist Viet Cong out. 
or the Viet Cong would steal the medicine. Thus was born the village defense program known as the Civilian Irregular Defense Group, CIDG. In 1963, the program wholly reverted from the CIA to the Green Beret. U.S. military newsreels always paint the rosiest pictures, but I do find this one very informative in explaining how the U.S. Army Special Forces established a toehold with the Montagnards through medical care. Our biggest asset in this kind of thing is the team medic. His main job, of course, is taking care of us. But there are no field hospitals in guerrilla fighting, so one of our medics has to know a lot about his business. With the modern medicines available, he can do a lot for people in places like this. The odd thing is, when you first ask whether anybody's sick in the village, the first answer is usually no. So then you offer to examine anyone who thinks he might be sick. And in no time at all, you've got a waiting line. What gets you most are the kids. They say people don't miss what they've never had. But you bring medicine into one of these villages where they've probably never seen a doctor, and the people turn out to be just as worried about their kids as you are about yours. Pull an aching tooth or Save a man's eyesight, and you've made a friend for life. You do this kind of work because you've got the medicine and because you're here. And God knows it needs to be done. In some of these villages, half the people have TB. Most of the kids have impetigo, and everybody has vitamin deficiencies. Any decent human being coming into a setup like this would do what he could without asking for a reason. But the fact remains that, from a military point of view, this is a good tactic. Squads and platoons of Viet Cong guerrillas have been coming through here with promises. Now, thanks to our medic, we've come along with something a lot better, something we can give them now. The South Vietnamese Diem government was uneasy about the U.S. arming Highlanders, in which 18,000 Montagnards were eventually armed. Green Beret training manuals during this time reviewed and reprinted French ethnographic analyses of the Highlanders to provide guidelines and strategies for inducing change and winning their allegiance. Training them to fight in the CIDG later evolved in fighting side by side with Americans in mobile response or Mike force units.
The U.S. Christian missionary effort in Vietnam's Central Highlands is often omitted when telling the Montagnard story. But during the war, the military cooperated with anthropologists who also cooperated with missionaries in a tight circle to forward the American war effort. And no one's interests were served by making any of these connections too explicit. The military tried to hide its dependence on CMA informants, while the CMA pretended that it was neutral in the war. This is the village of Ro Chai. Located high in the mountains of Vietnam's central plateau, it is part of the Dalat area. To this relocation village come the Vietnamese mountain dwellers known as Montagnards. A civic action program is underway here to improve the health and well-being of these primitive people. These films, taken on 11 December 1965, show a friendly visit to the village by a signal group chaplain and two civilian missionaries. For the chaplain, this is a regular part of his routine. He visits the tribes in the Dalat area quite frequently, delivering simple sermons and distributing small gifts. Betty Mitchell still works with Montagnards, only now in Greensboro, North Carolina. For decades, she worked with the Christian Missionary Alliance in Vietnam. Leprosy victims were converted from starving outcasts to farmers and weavers accepted by the tribal cultures. One day, she saw dead bodies floating in the Mekong River. So we realized, hey, we came to a country where there's war. And, but when we got up into the highlands, it seemed like it was more, more peaceful and uh, you didn't feel the tension so much in those villages. Probably a lot was that we didn't see was going on. The best example of anthropologist and U.S. government cooperation is Gerald Hickey, who truly was a thoughtful, benevolent scholar and advocate for the Montagnard. Hickey went to Vietnam in 1956 to complete his Ph.D. in anthropology, ending up there for most of the next 18 years through the entire Vietnam War. Rand Corporation hired Hickey to study and report on the Highland tribes. He lived through the bloody North Vietnamese night attack on the Nam Dong Special Forces camp in July 1964, behaving heroically with the Special Forces giving him a commendation for his actions. And he survived the full-scale battle at Bang Mai Tut during Tet, 1968. He witnessed the decline of the Montagnards from proud Highlanders to refugees from a war none of them wanted and few understood. Icky's study on the Montagnards lasted from 1965 to 1972, the longest running RAND project during the war. He became the undisputed expert on the Montagnards, unchallenged, and was his own boss with complete freedom to go wherever he wanted. His understanding of the Montagnards and his representation of their interests helped to resolve their conflict with Saigon in 1965 and assured their alliance to U.S. forces through the rest of the war. Despite the U.S. Army Special Forces' success in mobilizing the Highlanders and forming an unbreakable bond with them that lasts till this day, the CIDG program failed in its political goal of generating support from the Highlanders to the South Vietnamese government. In fact, many Highlanders participated in the CIDG primarily to express their ethnic identity and obtain military training, equipment, and organizational experience to resist not just the communists, but the South Vietnamese government. This was manifested in the Montagnard Full Row Army Revolts against the South Vietnamese at American Special Forces camps in 1964 and 65. The Montagnard during the war would be forced from their lands twice. First, beginning in the late 1950s when the South Vietnamese government began moving land-hungry Vietnamese onto Montagnard lands, and then later in the war by Americans and communist North Vietnamese who had turned Montagnard ancestral lands into a scorched battlefield. The South Vietnamese treated the Montagnards with such contempt and violation 
no U.S. effort could have repaired the relationship. This film shows a Vietnamese unit with a U.S. Army Special Forces advisor burning a Montagnard village. The U.S. Army obviously filmed it, and the U.S. archival film is actually labeled Burning a Montagnard Village. Two facts may provide insight. One, we know not all Montagnards supported the U.S. Some supported the Communist National Liberation Front, NLF, although this guy doesn't appear much of a threat. Two, by 1970, South Vietnamese forces began to assume more authority in the highlands, initiating a forced relocation program. Villagers were given short notice, usually only a few days, abandoning their possessions, which were looted by South Vietnamese troops. In some cases, South Vietnamese troops burnt their villages to the ground, according to Gerald Hickey. The South Vietnamese government thrust their culture upon the Highlanders, initiating a Montagnard resettlement scheme and between 1957 and 1961 resettled over 210,000 lowland Vietnamese into Montagnard land, which the Vietnamese considered public domain, but the Montagnard not only considered their own, but was necessary for their Swidden agriculture, the slash and burn technique necessary due to the poor quality of highland soils. In addition, Thousands of ethnic minority refugees from the north were resettled into the Central Highlands. This encroachment led to the birth of ethno-nationalist resistance in the mid-1950s. The communists were quick to seize upon this Highlander alienation from the South Vietnamese government and activated stay-behind Highlander cadres and reinserted communist Highlanders they had taken north in 1954. Thus, the Montagnards faced aggression both from the communist North Vietnamese and the South Vietnamese government. Our people is the one that really um, want to fight with anyone that comes into our land, including the communists. And we don't also want, we don't want the South Vietnamese to bring their people into our land either. In 1958, a Highland resistance movement emerged near Bon Matut called Bajaraka, an acronym for the four main Montagnard groups. Its leader was E. Bam Inul, a visionary widely believed to converse with spirits as well as with Charles de Gaulle. Pythons were said to coil beneath his bed, according to local lore. Full Row first made a name for itself as a militant group in September 1964 when it organized a rebellion among 3,000 Montagnard combatants and five U.S. Special Forces camps in the Central Highlands, and so turned on their South Vietnamese allies, killing dozens, taking others hostage, and disarming Americans on the bases. After several days of negotiations between U.S. military advisors and the full row militants and the deployment of Vietnamese military units near the camps, the rebels surrendered. A peace conference was arranged, but the truce between full row and the South Vietnamese government didn't last long, and a second rebellion occurred, violently put down by the South Vietnamese government. There were several full-row rebellions up until 1975. Meanwhile, E. Bom Inol, who had previously been imprisoned twice, took approximately 2,000 full-row followers and families and fled across the border to Cambodia. They established their headquarters, with the blessings of Phnom Penh, at a former French military site in Moldokiri province. Full Row incorporated not only Montagnards, but another minority group, the Cham, from the conquered Kingdom of Champa, once a rival to the Angkor Empire, which had been lost over centuries to the invading Vietnamese and the Khmer Krom, an ethnic minority living in the southwest portion of Vietnam. One characteristic of the Full Row Army from its inception until today among its former leaders was its staunchly religious foundation. Many Montagnards associated the Christian missionary presence in the Highlands with the American military war against Vietnamese communists, 
This connection was fostered by CMA rhetoric linking the war and God's work, as well as by the evangelicals' participation in the vast humanitarian relief projects. In their accounts, the Montagnards today inevitably link Christianity to the purpose of the Full Row Army. Christianity and Full Row are nearly inseparable. One even said, we were fighting for the Lord. Even while in exile in the Cambodian jungle, full row families met nightly to pray and worship God. In all of their social systems, religion was very, very predominant. Religion touched upon every aspect of Highland life. And so it was every individual's duty to maintain the harmony among man nature cosmic forces. Full Row presented the U.S. with a dilemma because the Full Row were militant forces of the Montagnards, which were U.S. allies, yet they opposed the South Vietnamese government. U.S. special forces were forbidden to work with Full Row itself under direct orders from General William Westmoreland, as the U.S. was not in Vietnam to support rebellion against the South Vietnamese government. But U.S. forces on deep operations along the Ho Chi Minh Trail would routinely ignore their superiors and use full row irregulars as guides. Some, such as Special Forces Lieutenant William H. Chickering, would later admit to turning a blind eye. He wrote that when he was a 22-year-old Special Forces Lieutenant at a hilltop base in Vietnam near the Cambodian border, his soldiers were Montagnard, and almost all were members of Full Row. Regarding Westmoreland's order, he said not only were the Montagnards Special Forces protectors and comforters, their cause seemed just, echoing the civil rights movement back home. When my battalion's ammunition and weapons began to disappear, I looked the other way, he said. By 1967, the full brunt of the war had hit the Montagnard like a tidal wave, whose luck it was to live in a war zone that both North Vietnamese regulars and the U.S. 4th Infantry Division were violently contesting. For example, near Plaikou in the Central Highlands, the deft, nimble Green Beret footprint gave way to the big green regular army machine by building Camp Inari, home to the 4th Infantry Division, right in the middle of Montagnard territory, which the Communists were also challenging. When vanguard units of the division arrived in country in July 1966, they found the road from Kinan to their future home just a trail in the wilderness. Living in tents and drinking from a nearby stream, the division's construction engineers immediately began clearing land. Next came a road network, then concrete foundations for important buildings, then construction for mess halls, orderly rooms, and 400 billets, housing 10,000 men. By early 1971, Camp Anari had an 8,800 square foot air-conditioned retail post exchange for soldier shopping, featuring six checkout counters, just like department stores back home, and four sports fields for baseball and football, 25 athletic courts for tennis, basketball, badminton, and other sports, and a weight room. The U.S. declared many parts of the Central Highlands as free fire zones, targeting for aerial bombing and the use of chemical defoliants in order to smoke out North Vietnamese units as the Ho Chi Minh Trail passed through the northern part of the Central Highlands. The U.S. moved 7,200 Montagnard to a constructed resettlement village, Idap Inang, which was ill-suited to their needs and to their livelihood. The Montagnards began to flee the settlement faster than they were moved in. Despite the positive manner in which the U.S. Army's first field force tried to spin the resettlement, the initial resettlement preparations were insufficient to support the number of people brought in. Rice harvests were lost, potable water was in short supply, and housing was inadequate. But over the next few years, Montagnard resettlement continued. It is estimated that more than two-thirds of all Highlander settlements were forcibly relocated, at least once, some repeatedly. In 1967 alone, U.S. and South Vietnamese forces created more than 100,000 
Highlander refugees. Gerald Hickey was able to appeal to the head of Cords, William Colby, who eventually was able to halt further relocations. And when they moved that, they moved us to the place that where we cannot grow our foods, where we cannot find, uh, if we need uh, fish, we cannot go to the river and fish. And when we need some meat, we cannot go to the jungle to hunt. And that way, uh, we have, we, we were depend, uh, dependent. We depend on the governments, but they failed to help us out. They didn't help us with food. They didn't help us with medicines. They left us wander around and die of starving and uh, malnutrition, disease, and everything like that. The American use of defoliates destroyed productivity of tens of thousands of acres of Highlander lands. Of the one million or so Highlanders in South Vietnam, nearly a third were killed or died as a result of starvation, illness, or other causes related to the war efforts of both sides. The U.S. pulled out of Vietnam in 1973, but the Montagnard continued a guerrilla war under great persecution from the now communist Vietnam. The leadership of the full role resistance had been badly battered. And we estimated in 1973 that anywhere from 200,000 to 220,000 Highland people out of a total of around 1 million had died in the war. 85% of the villages were either in ruins or were abandoned. And among some of the ethnic groups, not one traditional house was left standing, not one. And so by the, t by the time the war ended, the Highland world was shattered. It was a shattered world. And I said, a great many of the people who died were not killed by bullets or bombs. They perished because their world was shattered. My dry friend, Glick Rollin, who lives in Charlotte, North Carolina, tells his story. After the South Vietnamese government collapsed in 1975, the communists sent me to prison in NK, where, after 2.5 years, I escaped and went to the Central Highlands to join the resistance war for freedom. In 1979, our group withdrew to Cambodia, where we met the Khmer Rouge, and thanks to them, we escaped to Dong Rek Mountain, the border of Thailand, Cambodia, and Laos. Glad to bang to come to lay can up in your area. Upa mang ai ran hiu loi ke de phir thun thun bay bay. When I become a resistance force and I move to the jungle and the, the life is there is very terrible. So everything is life is less. No food, no clothing, no nothing, almost like wild animal. In 1985, we fled to the Nam Yun district inside Thailand, where we first applied for refugee status and were transferred to a refugee camp along the Thai border, after which we were transferred to a refugee camp in Bataan, Philippines. Finally, on November 19, 1986, we arrived in the U.S. and landed at Greensboro Airport. Upon the Montagnard's arrival, the CMA dispatched three former missionaries who had served in the Central Highlands to meet them as they got off the plane and to integrate them into their new communities in Greensboro, Raleigh, and Charlotte. These Montagnards began building new lives in America with the help of local Christian groups and retired U.S. Army Special Forces soldiers. Unbeknownst to the U.S. and apparently this 1986 Full Row Asylum Group, another Full Row Group was still holed up in Moldakiri, continuing the fight against the communist Vietnamese. A steadfast faith in God kept them alive. 
1992, the United Nations assumed authority in Cambodia and around August found this remote group. Immediately, a freelance journalist in Cambodia hopped on a United Nations helicopter and went to Moldakiri to visit the group. He wrote, this correspondent was landed by helicopter to be met by a group of men dressed in worn out fatigues and greeted as the first foreign journalist ever to reach the headquarters of the last guerrilla army still fighting the Vietnam War. He come to spend a night with me in the jungle. Then he look or he asked, who are you? How you call yourself? I explained to them we are indigenous people in Central Highland of Vietnam. Nate Thayer wrote at various times for the Far Eastern Economic Review Jane's Defense Weekly, Soldier of Fortune, The Associated Press, and more than 40 other publications. He is most noted for having interviewed Pol Pot, the first Western journalist to do so in 18 years. In 1989, he began reporting for the Associated Press from the Thai-Cambodian border. In October 1989, Thayer was nearly killed when an anti-tank mine exploded under a truck he was riding in. Upon Thayer's arrival, this full row group asked Thayer, please, can you help us find our president, Ibom Inul? We have been waiting for contact and orders from our president since 1975. Do you know where he is? Many of them wept as Thayer informed them he had been killed 17 years earlier. Thayer then wrote an article in the Phnom Penh Post, which alerted the world to this full row group. U.S. Ambassador Charles Twining worked quickly to fly the group to the safety of Phnom Penh and under U.N. guard, fearing retribution against the group. Americans from Washington to Phnom Penh sprang into action, like U.S. refugee worker Jack Price in Bangkok and others, to circumvent and expedite the refugee process to get the Montagnards promptly to the U.S., E. Henney, 75 years old and a pastor in Greensboro, North Carolina, was a leader in this hold-up group, and he tells his story today. In 1968, he was living with American Christian missionaries in Bon Matut. His mother and father had left him with the missionaries when he was eight because they were poor and wanted him to have a better life. The North Vietnamese 1968 attack on Bon Matut took his adopted mother's life. He joined Full Row, and when the communists seized Saigon, he fled to the jungle with the fighters. The first four years, they stayed within Vietnam, constantly on the run, hiding from the Vietnamese army. By 1979, Vietnamese troops were expanding their operations searching for Full Row and had killed or captured 8,000 members of an army once 10,000 strong, so, running low on ammunition, Full Row abandoned their bases in the Central Highlands and fled to Cambodia where the Vietnamese enemy, the Khmer Rouge, was in control. The Khmer Rouge granted Full Row permission to stay, but heavily taxed the group, requiring tiger and python skin and deer horn, and many times threatened to send the group back to Vietnam. Full Row continually moved, sometimes skirmishing with the Vietnamese, sometimes victim to tigers, and never staying longer than one month in a location. Full Row lived on a diet of cucumbers, leaves, corn, pumpkins, poisonous potatoes processed for five days to extract its poisons, and no rice. The first thing Hen Nee would do when they arrived at a new spot was erect a cross. He would then hold sermons for the soldiers, women, and children. Christmas was never missed. In conclusion, the Montagnard settling in the U.S. has been a tremendous success story and they have become productive Americans. Unlike the Hmong, who spent years passively waiting in debilitating Thai refugee camps, the Montagnard arrived in America after years of survival on their own in small guerrilla army bands. Meanwhile, according to Human Rights Watch, the Vietnamese government continues to persecute Montagnard, not only imprisoning activists,
but in some cases sterilizing Montagnards because of Montagnard refusal to abandon Christianity. Uh, really, I don't feel any happy because uh, this is just only 200 people here. So we are happy because uh, we we uh, live in the freedom country and we have everything. Very sad that it's a, a thousand, a thousand of the people in the jungle and uh, in the village of Vietnam. They are still suffering and uh, poverty and don't have anything. What follows are some interesting side notes and then sources for further reading and watching. In this period, the American actor John Wayne, at the behest of one Special Forces officer, began wearing a Montagnard bracelet, which he wore for life. While filming in the summer of 1967, John Wayne got to know the Montagnards. He became their honorary member. To signify this relationship, the Montagnard gifted Wayne the very brass bracelet he would wear for the remainder of his life. Wayne wore this gift immediately as Kirby in the Green Beret. John Wayne was a very vocal supporter and convention delegate for the right-wing Taft against the moderate Eisenhower in the 1952 Republican primary for president. Wayne, who had been, at 34, an acceptable age to fight in World War II, decided instead to do the war in celluloid because his career was just beginning to take off unlike Jimmy Stewart, a year older, who served with an exceptional war record. Wayne, at one point, during the 1952 convention, jumped out of his cab and yelled at an old veteran mess sergeant who was running an Eisenhower sound truck, why don't you get a red flag? Incidentally, this Green Beret soldier is John Kearns from Texas. During the war, he left the Army and joined the CIA, was codenamed Lone Star, and went to Laos as a CIA paramilitary officer to advise Thai troops, where he was killed in December 1972, just a few months shy of the ceasefire. He is honored with a star on the CIA memorial wall. For further reading and watching, a documentary, Living in Exile, excerpts shown here, was filmed on location in Cambodia upon full road discovery and can be purchased for four dollars from the North Carolina Department of Natural and Cultural Resources State Archives. Next, I will email you for free this Far Eastern Economic Review article Nate Thayer wrote upon full road discovery. Thanks to Jack Price for making it available. Just email me here. You can still find Nate Thayer's original article on the full road discovery and other Thayer articles at the Phnom Pen Post online archives. Next, I showed you the excerpts from a Voice of America VOA film, which you can find by Googling online. It is on the Montagnard in America's memorial service for Nate Thayer, who recently passed. For reading, several of Gerald Hickey's books on the Montagnards are available at Amazon and other outlets, and so are French anthropologist George Condominus books. This well-written article on Pastor Nee and Full Row is available to read for free at bbc.com. Thank you for watching, and please check out my other videos.